Welcome to the Holland Financial Report. It is March 6th, and it, this is a special Bike Week edition of the Holland Financial Report. And joining me, well, maybe a little reluctantly because he's not riding his bike today, is Robert Marr, our Vice President of Investments. Welcome, Robert. Good morning, David. All right. So um, in honor of Bike Week and the 500,000 people that have joined us here in Volusia and Flagler County, I thought, you know what? I'll, I'll don the Bike Week gear and ride my bike this week. And so um, this is what we do. So some fun stuff to do. All right, Robert, so let's do a quick rundown of the market and where we are. And we're going to continue our series on uh, the nuts and bolts of investing and topics and terminology that we use frequently on the report. And of course, that you hear in the news that we want to share with you and help to clarify some definitions. Okay, so real quick though for the market, Robert, you know that uh, you know the market pulled back a little bit year to date. The Dow um, still um, in positive territory, but um, not as not as strong. Year to date up three quarters of one percent. S and P five hundred still up year to date almost five and a half, and the Nasdaq still with a strong showing this year of up almost 12%. So um, any thoughts about the market and kind of the give back a little bit? Well, um, it did give back two weeks ago. Last week, it actually surged ahead. Um, it, the NASDAQ, S&P, and Dow Jones Industrial Average, all three of them came back pretty strongly last week. Um, again, there's a dichotomy. There's uh, what the market is expecting interest rates to do and what the Fed, they're still a separation there. Um, so we have to be careful with that. Um, you know, the market, it's, it looks like the bond market is understanding what the Fed is doing, um, which is why kind of bonds have come down quite a bit because yields have been going up. Uh, stocks are kind of ignoring that. They're like, no, we're, we're pushing ahead. They're way more optimistic, which it might turn out to be uh, warranted. Um, but then again, if it's not, um, we'll perhaps month two down the road may see more of a pullback than we would like. Um, but right now I'm focusing on March 22nd, next time the Fed is scheduled to raise interest rates, uh, still weighted to the 25 basis points, but there's a good chance um, about 30% out there for 50 basis point rate hike, so. Good. Well, and one thing that we had not planned to talk about, but I'll just throw in real quick is um, personification of the markets. You know, there's a natural tendency that the market thinks this and the Fed thinks that. And, you know, it, at the end of the day, that's a collection of what everybody does and kind of what it looks like the expectations are in terms of market behavior. So that that's that's why we do that, right? Yes. So, yes. Um, all right. So our nuts and bolts topic for today is... Uh, digging in a little deeper to how we refer and categorize the different types of investments in terms of the size of the company and then the, um, the nature of where those companies are located and what kind of market they're in. So let's start with size. You know, a lot of conversation around um, the mega caps and the large caps and the Dow and what's happening. But that is just one sliver, as you know, Robert, of the overall market. So um, let's do some real quick definitions. Large cap? Large cap, 10 billion to 200 billion in market capitalization. And all that is, is how much the company is worth. Um, mid caps, 2 billion to 10 billion, and small caps, 250 million to 2 billion. But like you mentioned, David mentioned mega caps, that's over $200 billion in market cap. Those are your Apples, your Amazons, Microsofts. Um, but then micro cap, anything under 250 million is considered micro cap. And these are publicly traded companies we're referring. So, yes. so your you know, typical mom and pop companies that, of course, a large percentage of businesses in the United States are mom and pop, as they've been called. Your small business, um, you know, obviously not publicly traded and well below these numbers, you know, <laughs> uh, a capitalization of maybe, you know, $500,000 to 10 million or 20 million or 50 million, you know, but nothing anywhere near the size of these companies we're talking about that are in the news, that are on the exchanges and have a public market for their shares to be purchased and sold basically every day. Right. All right, good. So is there anything in particular that you'd like to note, Robert, in terms of these companies and their sizes or the differences in the sizes between these companies and how they are able to well, either as they 
respond to the market conditions or able to adapt to the market conditions? Yeah, it's nice for academia for us to, you know, categorize um, different asset classes in large caps and mid caps and small caps. But, but as investors, okay, who cares? How does that help me invest better and earn what we would call alpha, uh, beat the market, beat the indexes of S&P 500, NASDAQ, et cetera? Um, so some generalizations, and I really want to put a big asterisk there. These are generalizations. These are not rules and laws of investing. Um, you know, but for example, usually, you know, when a country is entering into a recession. Large caps, again, you have your growth in value of what we talked about last week, but um, usually they will perform a little better than your smaller cap companies because they have more access to the international markets. They can diversify their risk because you. a lot of times um, we hear about a global recession, but most of the time different regions are in different um, areas or, or different time periods of when they're, they are actually entering into a recession. Conversely, um, when coming out of a recession, smaller cap companies do very well. Um, so, you know, th that's kind of when you look at sectors or size ca categorizations, that's where an investor might want to move from large to small or vice versa, depending on the economic cycle we're in. When we talked about growth and value last week, we talked about business cycles for individual companies. Now to understand size categories, David, it's helpful to look at the economic cycle an individual country is in. Um, and let me just add one other thing. Um, an individual country's business environment, the changing of the leadership, the changing of the guard. If you're going from um, one leadership that is has really beaten down on businesses to a leadership that is more open, um, allows more experimentation, that smaller and mid-cap companies thrive in that environment with more freedom to do what they want to do with fewer regulations. So a business environment and the tax code of an individual country will also work wonders for smaller cap mm -hmm, companies very good. as well. So another analogy I'll throw in here, uh, which I like to do, is um, with large companies, they're kind of like the aircraft carrier or the really big sh uh, tanker ships or these really large ships that go across the ocean and deal with all kinds of crazy weather and waves that are however many you know feet tall. Um, they're able to, quote unquote, weather the storms better um, with their larger size and resilience. You know, if you've got a, a couple billion dollars in cash as a large company, obviously that helps. And then the smaller companies tend to be like a little speedboat and uh, maybe they don't do as well in those large seas. Uh, but then when things calm down, they can be more nimble and adapt quicker to the environment and skirt around. So that's an analogy sometimes that works. Um, now, the next aspect of this we wanted to get to, Robert, as you know, and you've started to touch on it a little bit, and that is the market in which different Co uh, companies will operate. So when we start talking about, you know, different ways of viewing the equity market, we also can categorize according to the home base or the primary market that company is selling its products or producing whatever it is or providing its services. So how can we kind of break those up? Do you want to start maybe with the United States as a good you know, beginning launch point? Sure, the United States, Great Britain, Germany, France, those are, well, the United States, of course, is, is a developed nation. Um, and if here, we're based here in the United States, we talk a lot about, you know, United States, American stocks, large cap, mid cap, small cap, um, but non-US international are those other countries. They have developed markets, developed exchanges. Um, the rule of law is well established, uh, but the kind of the next layer is emerging market economies. Um, those are countries that are experiencing very quick, rapid GDP growth, uh, growing income for the citizens and its population, um, increasing debt. But one thing about emerging markets that some people may be misunderstand is that emerging markets do have an established financial system infrastructure. It's just their population, their GDP is experiencing rapid growth, they're accumulating more debt, et cetera. But then come frontier markets. And this is something I kind of picked up um, doing research on this. Um, more developed than your least developed country, like you know Cambodia that doesn't have, or um, some island nations that don't have a market at all, um, or are on the barter system, as, right. as you might say. Uh, but some of the um, 
frontier markets, many would think are, okay, they're very risky, like Nigeria. But actually, some of those on the frontier markets, as frontier markets are defined, Iceland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Western countries, democratic nations, well-established, modern, because of too small, too illiquid, mm -hmm. very small markets, and therefore very few companies that are very illiquid. So those are also frontier markets or frontier countries in, uh, in the category of frontier markets. Okay, so we have then developed countries, we have emerging, we have frontier, and then we have some that just aren't there yet on the radar screen with having established exchanges and all of that. Exactly. Okay, so these are ways to categorize um, different types of investments, and you know, you know where we're headed here if you've been watching the report. All of this comes together as part of building an investment portfolio. So you can slice and dice investments, meaning then that you can allocate your money toward a specific objective and then fine tune it by how much you put into each of these categories. And it allows you not only to benefit from diversification, but also allows you to, you know, throttle up or throttle down your particular financial or investment vehicle. So, all right, final, final thoughts on this, Robert. Um, I just have one final comment, and that is I'm going home to change. Okay, yeah, <laughs> hopping on the bike, no. No. No bike. <laughs> well, I did check, I know people are dying and say, where, he's gonna throw something in about a, a, a motorcycle stock. Uh, Harley up 16% year to date, if you wanna take a look at the ticker. Ticker, it is HOG, H-O-G. So, all right, so I'm gonna get back on my bike and uh, I'm gonna leave Robert to go ahead and take care of the investments for today. And we thank <laughs> you for being with us and we'll help you continue to plan stronger.